Apollo 13, 25,550 miles to go. They're coming in at 8,970 miles an hour. If you want some idea just how fast that is, you can get from London to Manchester in one minute and 20 seconds and get all the way to Glasgow in two minutes and 40 seconds. It all continues to go well aboard Apollo 13. James. Meanwhile, back in space, there is just over two hours to go to that uh, moment when they hit the atmosphere and start the plunge down through. Uh, the crew at the moment are going through the last preparations. It's been a very tense period, and one of the few men on Earth who knows what it's like to go through that, to come back from lunar orbit and head in towards the Earth with your fingers crossed that the heat shield is going to work and you're on the right attitude, is Neil Armstrong. And he talked recently to newsmen, yesterday, I believe, in fact, about what it was like up there and what he thought of the crew and the state of the mission as it was at this moment. If, if you were in the spacecraft uh, during re-entry, which would you regard as the most critical moment of all from the point of view of the commander and the crew? The parachutes. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, unquestionably the, uh, the most serious time point in the entry from, from my point of view. And the reason is that unlike Let's say you're sitting on the moon and the ascent engine doesn't fire. At least you have the benefit of time to consider, discuss it with the control center and, and uh, consider possible alternatives for getting that engine started. But when the parachutes don't come out, you're rather short of alternatives and considerably short of time. Armstrong, during your Gemini mission, you have to pass uh, through a, a phase of imminent danger. How does a human being feel at this moment? Did you think about death? Um, no, I, I didn't. Uh, there really was inadequate time for, for those uh, sorts of considerations. I've heard people say uh, when they got in a really tough spot, they've had uh, you know, their life story flash in front of their uh, minds and and uh, I, I didn't experience that in my own case. Uh, it was much more like uh, a pilot getting into an inadvertent spin in the airplane and recognizing that he absolutely must uh, solve his problem and, and uh, correct the spin before hitting the surface of the ground. And all his attention is directed toward that end. And that was rather the way we felt. Patrick, one of the things ahead in the next few hours, uh, part of what Armstrong was talking about, the preparations for this re-entry, one of the things ahead is the moment when the actual command module hits the atmosphere. Yes, indeed. And you are an expert on meteorites and meteors and all sorts of bodies coming in. What kind of heat is that going to generate? Are we going to be able to see it? Well, you certainly won't be able to see it from here because it's going to be below our horizon. Earlier on, there was a report from Cape Town that the returning spaceship had been sighted telescopically, and that, of course, is quite in order. But this is in the southern hemisphere where all the activity is going to take place. And as Jeffrey said a little while ago, as they come in, the command module and the service module and the lunar module, all of which are going to come back into the atmosphere, are going to come down in different places for the reasons that he gave. Well, the command module, of course, the heat shield will get incandescent, as this always does happen, but you're not going to see that unless you're fairly close to it, and it's going to be below our horizon. We did see, wasn't it 10 we saw coming back in, a brief glimpse of it up in the night we sky did indeed, just before but, dawn? We did indeed, but so far as I can tell from the, the calculations that we've done, this is not going to be the case now, this time, because, of course, for one thing, it's daylight. Uh, and, of course, so far as the service module is concerned, well, that is now fully fueled up. And therefore, when it comes back into the atmosphere, it is certainly going to make a very considerable bang. And if it were above our horizon, in spite of the daylight, we would see that. But so far as we can tell, this is going to be well below our horizon. Now, there, uh, is, there is one unusual feature of this, isn't there? That you talk, you're talking about a bang, um, the bang on the ground and stuff. Yes. But the sonic boom that, uh, that is made by the command module is made in the other way around from normal. Normally, we hear a Absolutely. sonic boom when an aircraft goes up through the speed of sound. Absolutely. This way, we hear it when it comes down through it. Exactly. It's going the other way around. Of course, you don't get that except with a spacecraft. You don't um, get it with meteors? Yes, you don't. Well, uh, occasionally you do with meteorites, but don't forget there's a very diff considerable difference in scale. Uh, the average meteor, the kind of thing you call a shooting star, is a very tiny thing, smaller than a grain of dust, and that makes quite a display in the sky. So these things will be visible if you happen to be in the right place, but so far as we are concerned at the British Isles, we are not. And uh, unless something's gone very peculiar with the calculations of the service module, we shan't even see that. We hope they don't. Farewell, Aquarius. We thank you. So said Swigert when the lunar landing module was cast away 
at 5.43. They, of course, had much to thank that module for. It had brought them back to within but a few thousand miles now. They are 10,700 miles away. They're approaching at 12,500 miles an hour. The speed builds up dramatically. We are now within the last hour or so of this mission. Just before we look ahead to Splashdown, let me remind you, those of you who come in, that the badly damaged service module was cast off into space just after a quarter past two this afternoon. And then Sveigert said farewell to the faithful lunar module, which brought them back so very smoothly and perfectly. They said goodbye to that at uh, 5.43. And the three men whom Grand Control said not all that long ago were damned fatigued but sharp got down to their preparations for re-entry. Now, looking forward very quickly to the re-entry, the timings to watch for are 8.35 as they start the re-entry re sequence in motion, and then at 18.54, that's six minutes to, uh, to seven, the crucial moment at 25,000 miles an hour when the command module meets the Earth's atmosphere at 400,000 feet up over New Zealand. Then, through the clouds, splashed down eventually by, we hope, by the deck of the waiting ship, Iwo Jimo, which is there with its helicopters on board and it's been standing by since dawn. We sincerely hope that on this program you will hear the band play, you will see the red carpet down and you will see those three remarkable men walk along it. That's our hope. James. One, six, I'd just five, like you to listen three, just a seven, second to what's going on up there now. Zero, five, two, three, six, two, one, one, six, Two zero.